Go ahead and start the hearing of the Maricopa County Board of Adjustment for Thursday, October 17, 2024. Rosalie, would you please take roll? Chairman Loper. Present. Vice Chair Person. Present. Member Cardin. Present. Member Clapp. Present. Member Ward. Present. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the announcements. This meeting has been noticed in accordance with the open meeting laws of ARS 38-431. Agendas are available within 24 hours of each meeting in the Maricopa County Planning and Development Office and are also available on the Planning and Development website one week prior to the hearing at www.maricopa.gov planning. With respect to the hearing process, cases will be considered in the order they appear on the agenda unless otherwise agreed to by the board. And this isn't really taking anything out of order, but we've agreed that items six and seven uh, will be under one presentation. I'm sorry, items three and four, uh, which is BA 240016 and BA 240017 will be done as one presentation, but two different actions. No? Wayne, I respectfully disagree with you. This is done all the time, but go ahead. Mr. Chairman, a variance has to relate to that particular piece of property. So the applicant has to present the justification for each of the pieces of property. They can't join them together. Okay. All right. Well, then uh, never mind on that. We will do those separately. They'll be the same presentation, but we'll do them as separate, but they would have required separate actions anyway. Back to the announcements. That's what I get for getting off track. Um, for each case, the applicant will be given a set amount of time to present their testimony. Any witness wishing to give testimony in a particular case shall notify the board of such interest. This shall be done by filling out a speaker's card for those in attendance or registering a desire to comment on the noted on the published agenda. Also at the appropriate time for each case, the chair will ask those attending in person and online who wish to speak to a case to raise their hand by clicking on that icon on the webinar screen. For those that are here today, uh, please fill out a speaker request card. Rosalie has them. If you're the applicant, we have that information, but if you're here just to speak, go ahead and please fill one out. Staff will provide the chair with the names of persons who have registered and noted a desire to comment and those registered participants who have raised their hand. The chair will call on each named participant one at a time. Such testimony shall be limited to a maximum of three minutes. However, the actual amount of time allowed for testimony shall be at the discretion of the board chair. The chair will conduct the hybrid in-person and virtual public hearing according to the bylaws and according to the rules established by the chair regarding public comment. All votes will be done by roll call vote only, and the chair will verbally identify the specific members responsible for all motions and seconds. And with that said, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes as everyone on the board had an opportunity to review the minutes from September 19th. And if so, are there any comments or changes? Seeing none, those are considered to be approved. We'll move on to our agenda under code compliance review V is in Victor 2024-00550. Darren? Mr. Chairman, board members, this is in District 3 at 37602 North 35th Avenue. Uh, it's an appeal of the hearing officer's order for a violation of grading without benefit of permits or clearance that had been issued. It was open March 11th, 2024 due to citizen complaints, multiple. <laughs> Uh, on April 10th, 2024, it was confirmed uh, where our code enforcement officer observed unpermitted grading. A notice in order to comply was sent on April 11th uh, after the compliance deadline of the NOTC. No applications were received. Uh, it was scheduled for an administrative hearing on August 22nd, 2024. Uh, staff received an email from the respondent that they received the summons. Uh, on August 22nd, 2024, the hearing was held. The respondent failed to appear. Neighboring property owners were present and provided testimony. The hearing officer uh, found the respondent responsible for the violation. 
It was ordered to pay a $500 noncompliance penalty immediately with a $30 daily noncompliance penalty to accrue until compliance is verified. Um, it would be dismissed if the property was brought into compliance by February 26, 2025. Um, but beginning the following day, if still not compliant, the daily noncompliance penalty would increase to $100. Uh, no penalty amount has been paid to date. On September 9th, the respondent appealed for code enforcement review by the board with uh, oral arguments. It's important to note the hearing officer made a finding of fact and reached his conclusion pursuant to section 1502 of the ordinance. And pursuant to article 1504.3.2 of the ordinance, the board may either affirm the hearing officer's order or remand it back due to a finding of procedural error. Staff has reviewed the record and sees no administrative or procedural errors. I recommend that you affirm the hearing officer's order and um, deny the appeal. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Gary. Darren, good overview, appreciate that. Any questions of staff by any of the board members at this time? All right, seeing none, I'll turn it over to the respondent or their representative, are they here in attendance? You could come up and provide your name for the record, please, and uh, uh, present your arguments. Uh, Micah McGarry. Well, go ahead. Could you speak again? Make sure the Micah McGarry. I don't think that microphone's on. Micah McGarry. Okay, sorry. Out of Thank you. Um, I just was. I have submitted um, for the permit application, considering the um, road grading but the complaint is for road grading that does not require a permit. So I don't know what other, what else I can apply for, but I had applied for the amendment for what I thought this was addressing, but evidently it is addressing something else um, that I had talked to Donna Garion and Ruben Gonzalez the uh, head of grading and drainage and the code enforcement uh, officer regarding grading the road. And they, I asked them if I could apply for a permit, but they said if you were just addressing uh, water damage or not changing the grade of the road more than, I think it is two inches, then you do not need a permit. So I. I didn't see that there was anywhere that I could apply for a permit to rectify this issue. Thank you. I, I question back to Darren, staff. Um, could you speak in regards to whether this was road grading, lot grading, uh, a mixture of both? Mr. Uh, Chairman, members of the board, it was road grading. Uh, he can obtain a grading permit for the road grading if he has submitted that permit application at this point. When that's uh, completed, that will remedy the violation on his property. If he submits for the road grading application. I, I believe the respondent indicated that he has. Okay. So that would that would negate this? That would resolve the violation. And if he does so by February 25th, that will, uh, all accruing daily penalties will be dismissed. And back to the respondent, you, you said you have submitted or you're about to? I have already. They've given me um, some red lines that I've since addressed and resubmitted, but um, that is all for strictly the work happening on 37602. There is an easement access that I keep, they call on me every time my neighbors will call into the county and I've met with several county officials every time they come and we talk about what I'm doing and they inform me that what I'm doing does not require a permit because it's less than a tenth of an acre and or it is only repairing water runoff ruts in the road without changing the actual grade of the road. So I think that there may be a slight um, bit of confusion between the two, whether it's grading the road or actually changing grade of my personal driveway, which that is what I submitted permits for. The other, which I'm, what they call on me for, does not require a permit. So I don't know why these two are linked, but for some reason it seems that I cannot 
get my the permit that I have submitted for one of the red lines is that I need to address this issue with the court. So I can't move forward because I can't fix this red line to get my permit, so on and so forth. Understand and thank you for the background. So our role really is not to adjudicate the violation itself, but to see if there's a procedural issue with this. But with that said, kind of looking at Wayne, Darren, others, if he's in for a permit, what's our best course of action here? I, I, Mr. Chairman, we, we recommend you uphold the hearing officer's order, uh, affirm the hearing officer's order, uh, and that he continue working on his uh, permit. If he completes the permit, it resolves the violation. And you said he has by what, February? February 25th to dismiss the daily non-compliance fines that are occurring. Okay. All right. I understood. Yeah, go ahead, member person. So Darren, just to make sure I'm clear, if we move forward and affirm the hearing officer's decision, and then Mr. McGeary can continue processing that permit, and he did make a distinction between one to physically do grading and one to adjust the grades, but it's I'm not hearing you say there are two things required. So if he continues with that permit and does gets does the work by February 25th, the, all of these fees that are occurring will be dismissed. All the daily the non-compliance daily penalties will be dismissed. Or whatever There's still an initial non-compliance penalty that's due and owing. Okay, thank you. Do you do you understand that? Um, I wouldn't understand why the initial non-compliance penalty would be allocated when I am already in process of getting the permit. I I, I believe you'd have to work that out with uh, with staff on that. That's not something that we have jurisdiction over, whether to waive or apply or not. But um, all right. Um, any other questions of the applicant or staff at this time? Yeah, I've got one more question. Member um, Ward, did you have your hand up? Oh, one moment. Yeah, go I ahead. Do. I'm sorry, I'm I'm confused. My understanding is that the applicant cannot continue because he is being fined for something that he can't find a permit for. Is that correct? He said they, that he is being asked to do some, to clear up a violation that is in fact not a violation, but we are here to determine whether he can get a permit, but isn't he still gonna have the problem if the prior violation of not doing something that is an argument on whether or not it needs a permit is being handled? Mr. Chairman, uh, Member Ward, no. Uh, he can process a permit for administrative remedy of the violation. Uh, if he had outstanding fees that were due and owing, those do need to be, uh, I'm sorry, daily non-compliance penalties or fines, those do need to be current. Uh, but he will not be held up for any type of permitting that is an administrative remedy resolving the violation of unpermitted grading. And so the permit that he has applied for now, but hadn't as he had not applied as of the time of the hearing officer's order uh, or at the time that the violation was verified and scheduled for hearing, uh, but he does have it pending now, that gets completed by February 25th, all the daily non-compliance penalties that have accrued will be dismissed but he will be able to process that permit. I will speak, I, I will, I will uh, this afternoon check to see if there's any type of confusion or if he's being held up because of the violation. But again, although we do hold up issuing and filing of permits due to outstanding fees or fines owed to the department for inactivity or activity um, against the property, the fact that the permit is necessary for administrative remedy of the violation, it will not be held up. Member Ward, that addressed your question? Okay, and then the, the respondent, you had a question? Yeah, the 
initial complaint is not associated with the violation to my understanding. The complaint is for road grading. The violation is for the installing a culvert, which is not directly associated with the road grading of that section of road. I talked to Ruben Gonzalez when he was there doing the inspection and the issue with the culvert is a minor detail missing on the site plan. I addressed that before the violation, the $500 non-compliance violation was ever issued. So the non-compliance violation is now being issued for road grading that does not require a permit. Thank you. Uh, Wayne, did you want to? Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, just so you understand, the question whether or not there's a violation has already been determined by the hearing officer. You don't have the jurisdiction to second guess that. If the respondent believes that the notice that was sent to him was for something other than the violation for which he was found responsible, then his recourse was to present evidence that that was a procedural mistake. That's the only thing you can do. I haven't heard that. If you have, then your alternative is to send it back to the hearing officer. Otherwise, as I said, the question whether or not there's a violation or not has been resolved. And as Darren has indicated, and as you well know from your experience, Mr. Chairman, if it turns out something is amiss, staff has the ability, even after the hearing officer issues his decision, to enter into a compliance agreement so that everyone's clear as to what has to be done. It's not a question of, does he need this permit or that permit? His responsibility is to bring the property into compliance and he does that with staff. He does not do that with the board. Understood. I think we're all just trying to get our arms around was what was what he was cited for and what the hearing officer heard. Was there a nexus between those? Was was, was it heard correctly, um, that process? And it sounds like that it was, like the hearing officer did hear correctly. And again, as as our county attorney representative just mentioned, for better or for worse, we can't decide the merits of the case. All we can decide is, is something procedural. Um, has, it, has it been done correctly per the required procedures or not? If not, we could remand it back, but I've not heard anything that says that it hasn't personally. It, it's a, a majority decision of the five board members here, but um, just wanna make sure you understand what our role is in this okay um maybe there's i was led here by staff because i had talked to ruben gonzalez the head of grading and drainage and donna gary on the head of code enforcement and i had talked to them before the hearing on august 22nd and i knew that i would not be there because i had i was out of country and i asked them is it imperative that i'm there i have already submitted the permits to rectify the issue of the only thing that was in fact in violation was installing the culvert. I had made the steps to remedy that before the hearing. Now, after the hearing, they issued me this fine. When the Maricopa County staff informed me that if I had made steps to rectify the issue, it wouldn't be necessary to go to the hearing. So then, uh, they couldn't figure out how to readdress that, so they sent me here now. So I didn't know that I was misled to this point, but that's all that I knew right. to Un know. Understood. A, a question, uh, Darren, and maybe to Wayne and others as well. Um, are you hearing anything today that would cause you to want to <laughs> spend a little bit of time before we made that ruling, like would this even have to come to us if based on anything you've heard today, if it was resolved and went away? Mr. Chairman, no, uh, okay. we, we would ask you to move forward. However, uh, I will uh, follow up with the 
appellant respondent uh, to ensure that his permit is being processed, that it's not being held up. And if he pursues it to completion, uh, we are willing to work with him on a settlement regarding that $500 noncompliance penalty. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Well, thank you. And I, I wish you the best of luck, uh, however this goes in um, just moving forward. All right. Uh, with that, and I failed to open the public hearing, but it was a public hearing, just the same. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this side? Is there anything else you wanted to add to the record at this point? Uh, no, I think if he's going to meet with me now, is that going to happen right after this? No, because we have other cases. Okay. I will call you. Uh, if you have a card, I'll follow up with you this afternoon. Okay. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Darren, for your willingness to work with him. Um, is there anyone else today who wishes to speak on this item? If not, I'll close a public hearing that I just opened and turn it over to the board for discussion and or a motion. Um, Chairman Loper, this is in my district. Um, I'm inclined to affirm the hearing officer's decision. I do find it a little odd that the hearing was allowed to take place without the applicant there, but I'm not familiar with <laughs> whether or not that's a rule. Um, so I would uh, move that we affirm um, the hearing officer's order of judgment for case V 2024-00550. Thank you. We have a, a motion to uphold uh, from member Persone. Is there a second? Second. We have a second from member Clapp. Rosalie, if you please take roll call or um, yeah, roll call vote. Member Cardin? Yes. Member Ward? Yes. Member Clapp? Yes. Vice Chair Person? Yes. Chairman Loper? Yes. Chairman, we have a motion affirming the hearing officer's order by a vote of five to zero. Thank you, everyone. We do wish you the very best and hope this hopefully this gets resolved quick. Your favor. Chairman, uh, Rachel will collect his contact info. We'll follow up with the applicant appellant. Yeah, uh, very much appreciate it. For the board's knowledge, the ordinance um, the ordinance uh, uh, indicates that if a summons is uh, served, whether or not the uh, the respondent shows up, the the hearing will be held. Thank you. Thank you very much. Move on to the um, regular variance or board action agenda for case number two, which is BA 2024-026. 202 and Higley Digital Billboard. This was continued from last month. Joel? Uh, Chairman, Loper, Chairman Loper and members of the board, agenda item two is BA 2024-026. Uh, regarding the 202 and Higley Digital Billboard, just north of the 202 and Higley Interchange in Gilbert and District 1. Next slide. Uh, this billboard is in the C2 zoning district and was subject to a prior variance along with another nearby billboard. Uh, to correct the record and as per the handout memo yesterday, uh, the variance is requested for the subject billboard, uh, which is referred to in the variance materials of that time as billboard one, uh, and per paragraph two, uh, one and two of the staff report were approved, and the variances for the other billboard, billboard two, were rejected by this board in 2017. Uh, the two billboards at the time were part of one property, which was later split, uh, with much of that property being annexed into the town of Gilbert. Uh, later became the subject to the billboard text amendment, and at that time, both billboards became legally non-conforming. Next slide. Uh, the subject billboard is currently oriented towards Higley Road's north and southbound lanes, and the goal of this application is to raise the billboard such so that it is visible to traffic along Loop 202 rather than only towards Higley Road as well as to digitize the board. As it currently stands, the only part of the freeway by which the billboard is visible is from the exit ramp onto Higley and not from the main travel lanes. Uh, the billboard itself is 400 feet away from the travel lanes of the freeway, whereas billboards of its proposed size and sign face are allowed to be a maximum of 300 feet uh, from the main travel lanes. Next slide. Uh, the two billboards constitute the only remaining parcels within Maricopa County's jurisdiction within this area, with both of their parcels being surrounded uh, by the town of Gilbert. Uh, staff would note the town of Gilbert did provide opposition in a letter dated July 10th to this case. 
uh, knowing that billboards are not allowed within their jurisdiction and that approval of this variance would have a detrimental effect on properties within their jurisdiction. Next slide. Uh, staff would therefore offer the following conclusions. Uh, the existing billboard demonstrates the ability for the property be, for the property to be developed under the existing zoning ordinance requirements, and therefore does not uh, there does not appear to be a peculiar condition in line with the statutory test as evaluated as evaluated by staff uh, at this time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Joel. Great overview. Are there any questions of staff at this time, Member Cardin? Thank you, uh, Chairman Loper. Uh, so, first question: uh, the the current board as it sits is legal non-conforming uh the i i guess the standards for uh, boards in maricopa county now allow for a 48 foot height which which could increase the height of this board already by 18 feet and a 672 square foot size can is the board only legal non-conforming as it sits right now at 30 feet and 300 square feet? Or could the applicant already keep the board legal non-conforming but still raise it 18 feet and make it larger? Uh, I believe, uh, Chairman Loper, Member Cardin, it's not a freeway board because it's not oriented to the freeway. Um, it's, I believe this is due to the distance from the main travel lanes as outlined by the ordinance. And of course, as this was uh, but prior to the text amendment, this would be kind of regardless of uh, whether or not um, any future variance approvals were granted. So, Mr. Chairman, just just to be clear, uh, billboards in unincorporated county are limited to a maximum height of 30 feet, 300 square foot base area, unless they are a freeway oriented billboard. Then the ordinance allows for a larger height and 672 square foot sign face. The applicant is seeking a variance. Uh, for distance from freeway travel lanes to allow this to be uh, altered so that it is a freeway oriented digital billboard. Thank you. Yes, Member Cardin. So thank you for that clarification. So just to confirm, if this variance is denied, that board would have to stay as it is in essence. Uh, Chairman Loper, Member Cardin, that's correct. Okay, and then my my next question is, my memory is, and this is a long time ago in 2017 when this, when the board actually heard this first case, my memory is that the town of Gilbert did not submit a letter of opposition. It was more of a letter just of comment, a comment saying, here are our ordinances, or here's our ordinance in the town, uh, but it didn't, I, I'm remembering this because I honestly found it odd. The the town didn't say in opposed or, or opposed to or approval of, I suppose it could be suggested that they were in opposition just because they were clarifying what the what the code was in Gilbert. But my memory is they didn't come out and say they're opposed where in this case they have. Can you, is there any truth to what I just said or am I remembering wrong? Uh, Chairman Loper, Member Cardin, uh, I would have to review the materials from the prior variance, but it is the case that um, the town of Gilbert has come out against this um, uh, particular variance at this time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Member Cardin, my memory is the same as yours, that it was a, uh, um, nothing came from the council with that. I think this is the first, or at least in my recent memory, of something so formal presented by Gilbert in opposition to billboards. So with you on that. Any other questions of uh, staff at this time from any other board members? If not, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. And the applicant or applicant's representative, which is I believe Gary Hayes, if you wouldn't mind Mr. Hayes, provide your name for the record and go ahead with your presentation. Sure, Gary Hayes, 2198 East Camelback, Phoenix 85016. Good morning. To Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I have with me today Jacob Zahn, who is the Director of Land Entitlement, I think that's his title, with Becker Boards, and he can uh, help me if I need him, which he's much better at some of this stuff than I am. As always, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Ellsworth and Mr. Gerard and their team for helping us get to where we are today. I think we can make this a little more um, simpler than, than some of the various letters and memos that have gone back and forth to try and, and correct a bunch of stuff. I think it's important to note, and I will try to address Member Cardin's uh, question before I go into my presentation, but I, I was, I didn't 
do the first variance back in 2017. I'm not sure if that was uh, Mr. Lally or not, I think. I think that was Mr. Lally. Um, but I do know that the town of Gilbert has been opposed to any billboard anywhere near Gilbert since I've been working on this stuff. So it's nothing new, or maybe it's new for the Board of Adjustment, but it is not new for Maricopa County. And I think Mr. Gerard will uh, back me up on that one. I think Mr. Maris is on the, the phone and you'll hear from him later, which I, of course, Mr. Chairman will reserve some time for rebuttal if that's appropriate. Boy, this is uh, testing my eyes. I'm getting used to the new setup because 20 years down there, thank you, member or vice chairperson. I may need them because that's a long ways away. It didn't used to be. So um, basically the current billboard is there. It's oriented towards Higley. The reboard, built billboard will be oriented towards 202 freeway. Now you saw in the first letter from Mr. Maris that he said, if the variance is granted, we don't want both sides digital because that was our original request. Based on that letter, we have amended our request to only make one side digital, keep the other side static. And so that was based on Mr. Maris's letter from, I think it was August. The procurement condition that we have here today is a result of a government taking, which we'll be able to see very plainly as we go through and look at these areas. It is my assertion, and I think hopefully you'll agree with me when we get there, that by changing to a digital billboard, it actually will help that area. There are several things that a digital billboard does that a static doesn't that is going to be helpful, and I'll walk you through that process. I'm not sure that the Board of Adjustment gets a lot of digital cases. I know PNZ and I know the Board of Supervisors are well versed in all the digital stuff and they hear it all the time. So I am going to spend a little bit of time talking about the difference between a static and a digital. One of the first things that's going to be a benefit is right now that billboard is lit from dusk till dawn. Every static board is, is lit all night long. So you have uplit or downlit lights, I don't remember what it is in this instance, that just stay on all night long. Digital boards are required to be shut off at 11 p.m. Right there, you're taking away a light source for six, seven, eight hours a night, depending on what time of year it is, from the community. I think that is actually beneficial to the community. And there's zero opposition for many of the surrounding properties. <laughs> Next slide, please. Rachel used to let me have the clicker, but now she's taken that from me. No, no, you can keep it. So this is an aerial context. Um, as you can see, and it's kind of hard to see in this, especially with my eyes, but the, you can see in green is where the billboard is. The property to the south is all ADOT. Now, that is a very large swath of remnant parcel that ADOT has. Look across the street where I think it's ALA. They didn't do that they took a much smaller piece of property. ADOT has taken a very large piece of property. If they had taken the same size that they did on the other side, we would be within 300 feet and I would be standing here today. But because of the government action of taking such a significantly large piece of property, almost two acres, we're here today. Next slide, please. So a little zoomed in, you can see the uh, ALA and you can see where their property line is. It goes all the way down. Of course, it's clearly less than 300 feet from the freeway. And the ADOT parcel, which is undevelopable remnant parcel, is there. Next slide, please. So as you can see from this slide, we are 250 feet away from a travel lane and 400 from the main westbound drive lanes. And we did crane it, which you'll see here in a minute, to see what that looks like from a perspective of the freeway to make sure it is viable from the freeway. And again, we're here because of the government taking. Next slide, please. So here's the variance test. Um, it's all what we all love and, and know. So does the property contain a peculiar condition? Yes, due to a government action, we have, do not have the ability to be where we need to be. It's interesting because, as you can imagine, takings and billboards are always kind of running into each other because where's most government takings happen? On roads. Where are most billboards? On roads. So in the city of Phoenix, there's a whole section of 
the ordinance, the billboard ordinance and sign ordinance, it talks about what happens if there's a taking. When they did the text amendment in 2017, maybe they should have added something about that. They didn't, but it is very common to have issues with takings and billboards. It's just the nature of the beast. So does applying the requirements of the ordinance, the applicant created unnecessary hardship? Is it self-created? Clearly it's not self-created and it is an unnecessary hardship because we're not able to put a digital billboard based on the government action. And it ties actually more into the third prong of the test, which is, does it have an impact on the intent and purpose of the zoning ordinance? I will make the actual opposite argument. Changing it to a digital billboard furthers the purpose of the zoning ordinance. Next slide, please. So what you see in front of you is the purpose of the uh, signed ordinance for Maricopa County. So this is the preamble, for lack of a better term, that starts the whole thing. And maybe I will borrow the vice chair's glasses on this one. But the purpose of the chapter is to promote public safety. One of the things that digital billboards require, and it's in the ordinance, and it's actually a wonderful thing and a wonderful tool. And you can see it down on bullet point number three, I believe. If there's a public safety emergency, digital billboards have to put that message up. If something happens within 10 minutes, every billboard that is a digital billboard can put something out. It doesn't work with static because they change them once a month. But if there's something, an amber alert, a blue alert, or anything, that can be put on all of these billboards within minutes. So clearly that goes to the public safety. Create an attractive business climate. If you have a static board, you get one, one person once a month. If you have a digital billboard, you have eight spots a minute that local businesses can advertise. Clearly that is an attractive business climate. We're helping our local businesses by going to digital billboards and enhance the physical appearance. So, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, taking lights, turning lights off at 11 o'clock at night from a noise or light pollution, from a dark skies perspective, from a, there's no residents around, but from residential perspective, that is very helpful. Now, then you combine that with, next slide, Ms. Applegate, the Luber technology, which is also required on all digital billboards. So the time that it's on, louvers are required to be on these digital billboards, which means it focuses the light where it's supposed to be. And I know you guys probably haven't seen a lot of digital louvers, so I wanted to put this slide in here. Basically, and I'm not an expert, I don't know if Jacob is, but as you can see on this slide, you don't have light pollution to the north. You don't have light pollution up. It focuses on where it's supposed to be. So even when it is lit from seven to 11 or six to 11, depending on the time of year, you have a better situation for the surrounding community. So that's why in my assertion is going to digital is actually beneficial and it's actually more keeping with the purpose and intent of the zoning code. Next slide, please, Ms. Applegate. Okay, this one is uh, craned. It's to, uh, I think it's 48 feet. I can't read that one if I tried, but I think that's what it says. And, um, or 50, what does it say, Jacob? 56, 56 feet. And so that's where you can see where the billboard would be located because there's a crane, a bucket crane at that height. So you could see it very well from all the travel lanes. Next slide, please. Again, just summary. The request meets statutory test. I, I believe it will be a benefit to the surrounding community. It has a peculiar condition. There is an unnecessary hardship. We are purpose, we are furthering the purpose and intent of the zoning code. And I know Mr. Maris is going to speak, and I'll be happy to have some comments after he's done. I'm available. If you have any questions, Mr. Chairman? Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question and maybe some other, I see member Cardin does as well. So yeah, I'm curious that the taking that you refer to, 
wasn't that what's the time frame of the establishment of the right of way versus the time frame when the billboard was put up? Do you know? I have, I have no idea. I think, I think that section of the 202 is 20, 25 years old. I, think, I see Jacob might know, but. I, I think, um, Mr. Chairman, it would be clearly before the, remember the code of the text amendment was in 2017. So I think it would have been probably before that. Would be okay. But it's not been a re recent acquisition by ADOT of any right of way in that area. Not that we know of. Okay, thank you. And then um, the second member, Cardin, the north side, the one that you've agreed not to make LED, will that increase, should the variance be granted, it's essentially then a, a highway oriented billboard. Will that sign face increase to match what it could otherwise be allowed for, or will that remain the same size it is today? It, it will be increased, but it will not be a digital board. Understood. All right, that's it for me, Member Cardin. Thank you. Gary, it's nice to see you again. I think it's been <laughs> about in, in this room since the last time I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was gonna tell you something, Mr. Cardin, or Member Cardin. Uh, I just thought about this the other day. Since 2002, there have been two District 1 representatives on this board, you and me. That's it. Wow. 22 years. <laughs> well, uh, that was Don Stapley, I think, but that's beside the point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it is It is nice to see you. I, I, um, I'll be honest, I'm struggling with this one. Um, not so legally, I need to say, because I, I'm, I'm more inclined towards the staff's um, uh, rationale of there is not a peculiar condition. Um, but I'll tell you for probably a different reason than what you've been tied, than what you've been focusing on. And that is more of the 500 feet from the other sign. Um, I drive that road every so often. I, I, when you're coming, north and northeast on the freeway so you so you're heading north east on the freeway or north and northeast that other sign that's already there along the freeway that's just 500 feet away is pretty big and it's it's just right there in front of you and uh, i was actually thinking i was when i when i drove by there last and i knew this was a case coming i thought is that the is that the stagnant sign but then i saw of course it was digital so i thought oh, it's not the other one i thought man how close is this other sign because it's this big digital one is right there. And then when I got off at Higley and went over, of course, I saw the other sign, which is smaller and not there. And I've, I've just been thinking, man, having two big, huge little digital signs there uh, really could be, uh, I, I don't know, just, just seems like there's a reason you don't have them that close together. Uh, and if I may, through the chair, Rachel, could you go back to the aerial? Actually, um... Go to the uh, sign. Actually, the 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 um the one with the crane on it. Actually, we'll start there. Go to the aerial, then we'll go to another one. So, um, through the chair, board member Cardin. The county has set up as a thousand feet. In this instance, there's a PAD, I believe, or just a straight rezoning. Rachel will tell me if I'm wrong, but they varied the standard to do it 522 feet. We actually don't need a 502. I think 502 is a typo. We are still 522 feet away because you can see there's a building about 502 feet away. I think staff said, hey, let's just keep it in in case when you're putting a new pole in, if you need to move it a little bit, but we don't need that second variance. We are still within the boundaries of what was approved by ordinance, zoning or by zoning rezone, to be at that 522 feet. So that second variance request of 502, I think was a typo. And we, we don't really need it. I think staff said, just keep it in in case you have to have some wiggle room if, if they grant it and when you're doing construction. I, I don't think we need it because clearly there's a building about 502 feet away and we're not putting on top of that. So I think member Cardin to your concern is the board of supervisors said, we think they can be this far apart and they granted a rezone to that point does that does that help boy well that's that's very new information to me because even the staff report talks about how the the c2 zoning district requires 1000 feet so i guess i just need to confirm with staff 
Uh, it's handout memo two, I think, talks about it, member Cardin. Okay. And there, so there was an error. And then that's why I, I think I was trying to, there's been a lot of back and forth with changes on handout memos and all this stuff. And I was just trying to make this as simple as possible. And, and so I think there were some um, clerical errors in the staff report. And so I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. So in the 2017, I think, Rachel, zoning case, I don't have the handout memo number two in front of me. The board of supervisor changed the separation distance to 522 feet. Well, wow. Well, we okay. That would that that would certainly make a difference on that concern. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, Mr. Thank you. And I'll just for the record read this in. That is, it does note that uh, under zoning case Z 2022076, that a CUPD overlay was allowed to to allow for a minimum distance of 522 feet. Um, so I just wanted to add that clarification. Thank you. Are there any other board members who have any questions of the applicant at this time? All right, we'll come back for any kind of rebuttal in a moment. Um, go ahead and if there's anyone else who wishes to speak on this item that is in it. Oh, I'm sorry, Wayne, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> if I may, council has attempted to make a couple of legal arguments and my role, I think, to advise you on the law. Uh, council has indicated that uh, governmental action is his special reason. This is not governmental action. Governmental action only occurs when it's on your property. The fact that there's governmental action on another property does not make that governmental action in the concept of zoning. The second thing that he raised, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and now I can't remember what it was. That's embarrassing. Um, well, I do want to talk, though, about where he went on about advancing the intent and purpose. You only reach that part of the test after you've determined that there is a peculiar condition and there's an unnecessary hardship. And I remember the other issue. It was taking. This also would not be a taking because a taking occurs when the government does something to your property, not your neighbor's property. There isn't a, one of the tests for a taking would be that you can't use your property. There's existing billboards, so that also wouldn't come into play. I would like to address one other thing because I know there's a speaker and that is the issue and member Carton also raised it of whether or not someone or in this case, the town of Gilbert is opposed to the billboard. Opposition or support of a, an application for a variance is irrelevant. The only question you get to decide is, is there a peculiar physical condition of the property? And if you find there is no pe peculiar physical condition of the property, the courts have held your inquiry is finished. If you do find there is a peculiar condition, then you have to decide whether the regulations of the zoning ordinance have caused an unnecessary hardship such that there is no reasonable beneficial use of the property. Those are the only two things you have that you are allowed legally to decide. If you decide both of those are present, then you go to the question of whether or not it advances or is contrary to the intent and purpose of the zoning ordinance. And when you get into that, you have to be very careful because now you're starting to tread into the area of what the Board of Supervisors decides when they rezone. So the opposition, we've had this before, and this was a good opportunity because uh, Member Clapp raised an excellent question in her email that I saw this morning. I don't know if everyone got to see it because there seems to be some change in tone or procedure from Gilbert. And I just want to emphasize the fact that if a hundred people come out opposed or a hundred people come out in favor, it's really not relevant to your consideration. Thank you. Understood. Thank you very much, Wayne. Mr. Chairman, sorry to interrupt, but just for the record, 
uh, member Clapp's email was a question directed to staff and it wasn't part of an ongoing dialogue with the board members. Which it couldn't be because that would violate open meeting laws. So understood and thank you. Um, all right, do we have anyone in attendance in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? Nothing, Jacob? No? All right, do we have anyone online? We Chairman, do. I have uh, Kyle online. Go ahead, Brother Mayor. Yeah. Right. You could go ahead with your name and identify who you're representing or who you're with, which I think we know, but just for the record, um, we'll appreciate it and go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Kyle Maris. I'm the Development Services Director for the Town of Gilbert. So appreciate the opportunity to um, voice our concerns on the on the billboard. Um, and you are right, um, Chair, Vice Chair, and, and members. Um, Gilbert has been opposed to any and all things uh, related to billboards. Uh, even the text amendment in 2017, we um, sent in uh, several letters of concern, um, knowing that there were going to be um, lots of billboards uh, proposed and um, built in Gilbert, in Gilbert, and that there would be a lot of variances um, asked for it as well. Um, as Joel had mentioned, um, the offside billboard signs um, are prohibited in Gilbert. So I recognize and realize this is uh, a county island within the planning area of Gilbert, but um, just to be clear, um, billboard signs are prohibited within all of Gilbert. Um, this request, um, decreases the separation, increases the maximum distance from the freeway main travel lane, uh, increases the billboard height to 48 feet, and increases the size to 672 feet, which this board or a previous board had previously denied. Uh, and it also proposes to change static face to digital. Uh, I understand that now there's a proposal to only do it on the south face, um, but that still is, is uh, something that we would be concerned about. Um, as your attorney had mentioned, this is clearly not the intent of the county code. Um, increasing visibility of a billboard in a location that the county zoning ordinance did not envision, um, in our opinion, is, is against the, um, the text amendment that was done and the um, county code. Um, and as, as noted, the proposed height increase is only necessary um, because now the digital sign would be located even further from the freeway um, than the code permits. Um, it is our opinion, too, that the increased billboard height, size, and digital face would have a detrimental impact on surrounding properties due to increased visibility. Uh, we currently have development, um, development proposals for the property that you can see that's north of the storage unit and uh, east of the storage unit. So there is economic activity that is happening in that area um, as we speak. Um, I also just wanted to mention, um, closing up, that our mayor and council have also expressed their opposition to this variance request. Um, and with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions or, or close. Thank you very much, Kyle. Are there any questions by any of the board members? Uh, yes, Member Cardin. Thank you, Kyle. Um, just thank you for for coming or for expressing this opinion. I um, I'm just curious, recognizing there's a billboard already there, does Gilbert see any value of a digital billboard over a that that's turned off at 11 p.m. and turns back on at sunrise versus an always lit all night uh, billboard? That's a great question, um, Member Cardin, and I think um, a lot of it has to do with the size of the billboard. Um, a smaller billboard is lit, but it, I don't believe it has the same impact as a larger billboard. Um, that is that that the lights turn off at a certain time. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, obviously, we would prefer to not have the billboards at all, um, but we would like to have the lights um, turned off. My concern would be just the um, size of that sign, um, and it is a greater light source if the sign is bigger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Member Cardin, and again, thank you, Kyle. Are there any other questions uh, by board members of um, the speaker, Kyle, with the town of Gilbert? All right, seeing none, thank you. Kyle, we may have more questions for you, if you wouldn't mind remaining online for a moment. Do we have anyone else online who wishes to speak on this item? We're not aware of anyone else online. All right, thank you very much. Um, um, 
back to the applicant. Uh, three minutes, please. Okay, I think I can get it done in maybe two. That'd be awesome. So a couple of things. One, I, I think what, what we did here is that Gilbert doesn't allow them, county does. That's why we're here, it's a county island. Two, I, I heard Member Cardin's questions, I heard Mr. Maris's responses, I've talked to my client, and I think we can come up with something that might help a little bit of all of this stuff as well. One is the static board will keep the same size it is today. And we will agree to turn off the lights of the static board at 11 o'clock, just like the digital. So there is a great benefit to the town of Gilbert based on what Mr. Maris just said by having that digital. It's turning it towards the freeway. One side will be digital, the other side will stay static, and it will be a smaller billboard or the same size as now, not as large as the digital. And then it will also make sure that all those lights are extinguished at 11 as in accordance with the digital section of the ordinance. Is that helpful, Mr. Chair? It certainly is to me, but I'm one voice. But I, but I will note, and I'm looking to Wayne and to Darren, we can't stipulate on uh, variance requests. I can't. You can't, but you I can. Certainly can. But it, but it's an enforcement item. Um, Darren, Wayne, Mr. Chairman, uh, that is correct. You can't put conditions on a variance. We understand that he's gone on record, and we will um, review the permit accordingly. I hope Mr. Gerard will tell you that uh, I've never told him something I didn't back up later. Is that fair, Mr. Gerard? 20 something years now? It's Just my me. understanding that part of the application is to increase the size of the static billboard now. Is that correct, Gary? I, I think, Wayne, um, through the chair, Mr. Peck, it's because it would then be a freeway board. Right. Thanks. So, so it would be, but it's only because it's a freeway board. But then we are, then you could, I think, as Mr. Peck is saying, limit the size as it relates to the variance request. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Peck? No, what I'm saying is they would have to withdraw that part of the application as it relates to that board because with all due respect to Mr. Hayes, as he indicated, a prior attorney represented the applicant and subsequent attorney might not be as willing to live up to what Mr. Hayes just told us. So to make it official, that part of the application would have to be withdrawn because your only authority is to say yes or no. I, I Understood, I may, Mr. And, Chair. One moment, please. Yeah, sure. All I see in front of us are two requests, one dealing, both dealing with separation requirements, and really the second one, it sounds like, isn't necessarily needed from the clarification under the CUPD. Uh, Darren, is that accurate? Is there's not really a request for size? And I'll get back to you in a second. If, if, yes, if he's confident they can maintain the 522 foot minimum from the edge of board to edge of board, uh, that is, that he can withdraw that request. And I believe council is indicating that he should withdraw the request for the north face of the of the sign. But but that request is really in front of us, just the the distance. Go ahead, Mr. And, and, and Mr. Chair, if I may, the application doesn't get into that type of detail. I get exactly what you said. Is it 300 feet or 400 feet? So I don't know how I could withdraw that application. And so I think from, from my perspective, and I'll put it in writing with Mr. Peck, I'll actually have officers of the company send it in writing. If he's concerned about subsequent attorneys, I do have Mr. Zahn here who will tell you that's how we're gonna do it. But I don't think there's that specific, that word, in the application. Uh, yeah, and I'm not seeing it in front of me and I agree with you, but go ahead, Mr. Peck. It's the part of the show where there's a little sidebar and, and Nick usually sings. I, I think Mr. Peck has explained it to me efficiently and su <laughs> su succinctly. You know, he did used to be my lawyer as well, and actually he yells at me more now than he did then. So I think the, the withdrawal would be to have what is currently the north face be separated at 400 feet because if, and if I can figure this out now, I, I'm going to need some help, Mr. Peck. But if we would draw to have both faces and only have one face being a freeway board, so the separation distance would still be in effect for what was currently the north face. So it could not be bigger by the ordinance. If the south, so the request would be, I think Mr. Peck will help you with your uh, motion if we get to that point. 
to allow the south face to be 400 feet from the freeway and not even talk about the north face, then have it separated that way. Mr. Peck, did I get that right? Okay. I just, I just need a little coaching. I got there. Darren? And, and, and I, and I want to apologize in advance for um, adding another issue of concern. Uh, I believe the ordinance also speaks to a digital board has to be oriented to the freeway. So the question is, is the angle of the south facing board oriented to the freeway or oriented to Higley Road? Um, I know the, this permit was originally, this billboard was originally permitted as oriented to Higley Road, and that's how it originally on the old ordinance was allowed to be so close to the other uh, billboard. It became non-conforming with the text amendment uh, because it was within a thousand foot radial distance because the old ordinance used to say thousand foot linear distance on the same road. But they did get an issue. They did get a, a zoning case. They rezoned after this, uh, after all the territory around these two billboards was annexed, and we were holding up any building permits because the lots were substandard with regard to area and width for C2. Uh, so they got it rezoned to C2 CUPD, the lot area, lot width, and they added the separation. Um, so, but the question is, under our ordinance. Uh, would they not have to reorient the this billboard and then both there really wouldn't be a north and south face um there'd be an east and a west face and and they would both be oriented towards the freeway uh i guess the question is would this i think there's a question as to whether the existing billboard south face today even though it can be viewed from the freeway is it oriented to the freeway for the ordinance language. And if I may, Mr. Chair, um, we, we are planning to orientate that way. Mr. Zahn did just, and that's why I bring him along, did also bring up something if we would draw the other one, we are gonna go higher, not bigger, but higher. And if we don't keep it as a separation distance of 300 or 400 feet where 300 is allowed by right, then we would be in a situation where we have a billboard down here and a billboard down here. So. I, I don't know as as I'm as I'm thinking about it whether or not we can withdraw it, but I can assure you, and, and I hope my word means something around this place, that uh, we will make it the same size for the static board that it is today. But we do intend to rotate it so that it will be seen. And that was Rachel. If you can go to the uh, crane picture. One more. There we go. So that's where you can see the billboard from the freeway. And so I think what, what I've heard from, from uh, Town of Gilbert, what I've heard from some of the board is a concern about both sides digital, getting these bigger boards up there. So I'm trying to figure out ways to address concerns that are raised and still go forward with what we're proposing today. Hopefully that helps. It does, and it could. I know there's design configurations. It'll be a fun wind load, but there's some design features you can do to um, potentially alleviate this. Um, all right, any other questions of uh, the applicant at this time by any of board members? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing and turn it over mm -hmm. to the board for discussion and or a motion, and it, and it, it seems to me um, the rationale as presented may or may not have some flaws to it, no offense meant, but um, historically I've been supportive of the billboard industry and what they're trying to do. And in general, I'm, I'm more or less supportive of this particular request, but there are some moving parts not the least of which is, you know, the recent memo that we got that talked about it, the uh, the underlying zoning case, um, the configuration of how this would look, the how that north face would be along Higley. Um, I don't I don't see us ever getting any kind of a warm fuzzy from the town of Gilbert. No offense, meant Kyle, but we all understand Gilbert's uh, position on offsite advertising. 
and I don't find fault with that. It's it's why why communities adopt the standards that they do. But um, I'm wondering if maybe we kick the can on this and continue this for a month um, to allow maybe come back with what that design could look like, uh, maybe uh, solidify or what, what's the word I'm looking for in English, try and put, you know, try and memorialize, I guess, what you, what we're trying to do about that we've talked about today. Again, I'm one voice. Um, I'm in favor of how this is going. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. But uh, this is in District 1. And Member Cardin, I see your hand. You have your hand up. Go ahead. Chairman Loper, thank you, and 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 I appreciate the thoughts you just shared. I um I also I'll admit I came into this meeting after re having read the staff report, uh, with my biggest problem being how close the boards are together. That said, I think uh, Mr. Hayes took the wind out of those sails with pointing out that the the distance is actually fine. I mean, whether it's 502 feet or 522 feet. It uh, doesn't really seem to make that big of a difference to me. Uh, to your point of giving it another month to uh, to just kind of see what can be worked out, I, I don't know to if I've understood, I, believe it or not, Mr. Peck, I've heard you every time you get up, and I know even a lot of the things I'm bringing up right now shouldn't even be thought of a considered part of a thought process. Um, but uh, that being as it is, uh, I think Mr. Peck's one of his points is any anything that gets negotiated isn't going to be something that we're going to be able to stipulate to uh, on these on on this motion. I think next month it would still be the same motion in front of us uh, if they're trying to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. So recognizing it, it's not uh, it's not what the town of Gilbert prefers. Um, and I'll admit that even that even uh, is is something I, I like to consider. I am now, after hearing all the arguments, uh, I'm inclined to uh, to uh, approve BA 2024026, and I'll even make a motion in that regard to approve. Um, but I will uh, please don't force a second if anyone else wants to say anything. Thank you. We do have a motion for approval by Member Cardin. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second by Member Clapp. Um, any more discussion? I, I would just add, you know, I think even though we're talking about two separate variances, I think we can kind of agree the second one, there's a situation where it may not even be necessary. And the first one, in my opinion, the billboard's already there and um, they're the things that they're actually talking about changing aren't the things we're deciding on the variance. So I'm comfortable with approving it. Thank you. Go ahead and call for the question. Rosalie, would you please do roll call? Member Cardin? Yes. Member Ward? Yes. Member Clapp? Yes. Vice Chair Person? Yes. Chairman Loper? Yes. Chairman, we have a motion for an approval by a vote of five to zero. Congratulations. Good luck with everything. Move on to the next item on the agenda, which is BA 240016. And as mentioned previously, I stand corrected. These need to be separate presentations uh, and obviously separate actions. So I'll turn this over to Nick. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Loper, members of the board. Case BA 240016 is a request to establish a lot width of 132 feet on the Bachmeyer property, where 145 feet is the minimum required in the rural 43 zoning district. Next slide, please. So the owner is proposing to build a single family residence on what is currently a vacant lot. Next slide, please. So the subject property was created following a series of recent lot splits. Originally, the site formed a portion of a much larger parcel measuring about 40 acres with each side measuring about a quarter mile. Uh, this larger parcel, 506-44077, formed parcel one of the Horseshoe Trails amended record of survey recorded in 1996. A minor land division was recorded in 2021 in which five child parcels were created uh, designated with suffixes A through E. Uh, four of these parcels measured about five acres each, whereas parcel E measured uh, 20 acres, forming the east half of the original parent. Uh, next slide, please. 
So as of today, parcels A, D, and E remain active. However, in 2023, parcels B and C uh, were further split five ways each. In April of that year, Eden Bachmeyer took possession of these parcels, and although both were recorded under the same deed, each received its own legal description. Uh, the following month, uh, separate deeds were recorded for each. Uh, the new deed for parcel B provided legal descriptions for what would become its five child parcels, and likewise for parcel C. Uh, Ellen Ramsey LLP took possession of parcel parcel B and what would become its five child parcels, and Eden Bachmeyer remained in possession of parcel C and what would become its five child parcels. Uh, resulting from these unregulated lot splits were two parcels that do not meet lot width requirements, uh, 506-44077K, child of parcel B, and 506-44077Q, a child of parcel C. Uh, the latter is the subject of this request, whereas the former is the subject of a separate request uh, per case BA 240017. Uh, staff notes that the remaining eight child parcels of B and C all meet Rural 43 regulations. Uh, next slide, please. So staff is uh, unable to identify a peculiar condition of the property. Uh, typical for most properties in Maricopa County, the parcel is relatively flat, uh, rectangular in shape, and is not encumbered by hillside slopes or areas of floodplain. Um, the proposed residence would exceed all setbacks required in the Rural 43 Zoning District, and if not for the substandard lot width, variance would not be necessary. Uh, staff is also unable to identify an unnecessary hardship created by the enforcement of the zoning ordinance, uh, since the substandard lot width was created directly because of an unregulated minor land division initiated by the owner, uh, the resulting hardship was created in the line of title and was therefore avoidable. Uh, finally, the granting of the requested variance, the need for which could be negated with a corrective lot combination, would fail to preserve the general intent and purpose of the zoning ordinance. Uh, the board finds the applicant has satisfied the statutory test and has stated its findings on the record. Uh, the grant of this variance will memorialize the following. Uh, item A, variance approval establishes a 132-foot lot width for APN 506-44077Q. And at this point, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nick. Uh, questions of staff? Mm -hmm. Member Persone. Um, thank you, Nick. My question is, um, if parcel Q were to, the width were to be increased by 13 feet to meet the code requirement, and that would be taken out of L, M, N, and P, would those ones also meet their depth requirement? I believe they would, yes, uh, okay. Member Persone. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff at this time? All right, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. And the applicant or applicant's representative, and I have a card for Esley Villar. Yeah. Oh, I said it right. Go ahead. Okay, so for, I had the slides for the, for both of the cases together, but still. Um, the reason for the rezoning, I mean the for this uh, the issue co uh, was caused originally for, by the subdivision. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Next. So we faced this problem when we submitted for the building permit, and according to the like the zoning, it's the R forty three, and it's meeting all the requirements except for the width that will be 145 feet instead of the one that it has right now. Um, and next one, please. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're meeting the lot area that it will be the one acre and the other parcels, they all do have the one acre. And the thing that about the um, going back to the original um, lot, it's that already two parcels there have uh, building permits, so that will be a little bit difficult for the part. Let me sure what else. Yeah, and yeah, we're we're just um, asking for the variance because uh, we're not meeting the width requirement. That that'll be it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the applicant at this time? 
Member Persson. Hey there. Um, Rachel, would you mind going back to that one slide with the LMNOP on it? Um, thank you. So my question is what I asked Nick previously. Is there an opportunity to adjust these lot lines? Which are the two parcels that already have the permits on them, I guess I should ask first. Um, for the top part, it will be the, if not mistaken, because I have them a little bit mixed, but I think if not mistaken, the two on the, like, on the top and the, yeah, that one. L and M. L and M. Okay. L M and I think also which one is that? Yeah. P. Not, but I'm not sure which because one of those is, is in process. But um the others one the other ones have uh the one acre area. So that would kind of if it if the one the the Q would would to be, be changed, it would change the um, area and the other ones, so. Okay, and Nick's gonna add on to that. Yes, uh, Vice Chair Person, I did wanna correct a mistake I had made earlier. If the lot with the parcel Q were to increase taking from the two parcels to the north, those two parcels to the north still could meet lot width and lot depth requirements. However, because each of those five parcels within the former area of parcel C are each one acre now, mm -hmm. taking from those two parcels immediately north while keeping those two parcels would subtract from, would bring them each under an acre. It would make those parcels non-conforming. So okay. the only remedy here would be a lot combination, essentially. Thank you. Yeah, that helps. And sorry, I should have asked that question first. So my only other comment then on it is, since you're, I know we're only talking about the north half right uh -huh. now, but since we are also going to have the separate case talk, talking about the south half, it does make me wonder if those two pieces that are subject to the variance could be combined, like Nick suggested, and then split the other way. Okay. I think then they would be the same size, uh -huh. but they would then meet the width requirement since all the other parcels meet the width requirement. Okay. So just throwing that out there, um, I don't know if that makes sense. I said, uh, Chair Person, it depends on the current uh, length of each property. If it were, if they were to be combined and then split such that you have one parcel in the east, one parcel in the west, as long as the lot width remains at least 145 feet in the acreage one acre which in this case it would be um it could be feasible i am not sure of the dimensions the uh i'm not sure of the length dimensions of the property at this time okay thank you for humoring me on that back to the applicant the conversation that vice chair person and nick were having regarding basically mm -hmm. instead of going east west you'd flip it so it's a north south yeah um, is that anything you'd be inclined to pursue? Yeah, if it if it meets the requirements, yeah. Okay. Because I, all right. No, I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions of uh, the applicant at this time? No. All right. Thank you. Hold tight. We may have yeah. something for you. Um, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? I don't see any hands raised. I have no speaker request cards. Do we have anyone online? Nope. Chairman, there's no one online. No one online. I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. This is in District 4, my district. And for my two cents, it sounds like there might be a remedy for this that would negate the need for a variance. Um, so I'm inclined to continue this for a month and allow you to work with Nick and staff to see if there's a resolution. If not, it's cost you a month, but you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to refile the paperwork. Um, would you be good with that? Yeah. Okay. So if someone on my behalf would be interested in making a motion to that effect or another motion, I would uh, greatly appreciate it. Anyway, Member um, Persone. I move we continue case BA twenty four zero zero sixteen to the November 2024 Board of Adjustment meeting. We have a motion for continuance by Member Persone. Is there a second? Oops, second by Member Ward. I, her hand went up first. Um, 
Rosalie, would you please take roll call? Member Cardin? Yes. Member Ward? Yes. Member Clapp? Yes. Vice Chair Person? Yes. Chairman Loper? Yes. Chairman, we have a motion for a continuance by a vote of five to zero. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, willingness to work with us and with staff in all niceness. I hope we don't see you in a month so because it gets worked <laughs> out. But uh, in any event, if we do, we do. Okay. So thank you and good luck. Uh, move on to the next item on the agenda. Should I just make a motion to continue this too since they're kind of well, related or not? I was going to go there. I oh, just thought sorry. Joel would like the opportunity oh, to say you something. Still want to say something. Even yes. if he wants to say ditto. Love it. <laughs> go ahead, Joel. Take it away. I, I can present briefly, but otherwise, yes, this is Parcel South. It's the same request, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. No, we're good. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Member Persone. Um, I move that we continue case BA 240017 to the November 2024 Board of Adjustment hearing. We have a motion for continuance. Before I ask for the second, I was remiss in asking the applicant if you're okay if we continue this one as well. Of course, they're related, but it is supposed to be a public hearing. If you just want to nod, then yeah. we'll, okay, good, good. All right, um, do we have a second on the motion for continuance? Member Cardin, you were quicker on the draw that time. We have a second by Member Cardin. Rosalie? Member Cardin? Yes. Member Ward? Yes. Member Clapp? Yes. Vice Chair Person? Yes. Chairman Loper? Yes. Chairman, we have a motion for a continuance by a vote of five to zero. Thank you. Good luck. Ditto with everything I said Thank as you. well on the other one. Move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, item number five, BA 240022, which is a an interpretation of Article 1207.3.1 of the Maricopa County Zone, Zoning Ordinance. Adam, turn this over to you. Thank you, Chairman and Board Members. Adam Cannon, Planning and Development. Case uh, BA-240022 is a request for an interpretation of Article 1207.3.1 of the Zoning Ordinance. Uh, just as a refresher, Article 303.2.1 gives authority to the Board to interpret the ordinance when the meaning of any word, phrase, or section is in doubt, when there's a dispute between the appellant and the zoning inspector, or when the location of a zoning district is in doubt. Interpretations of the ordinance will apply countywide in all supervisorial districts and not to a specific site or property. This uh, request pertains to Article 1207.3.1, which is on your screens. Article 1207.3.1 requires a community residence, which is uh, formerly known as a group home, to be distanced at least 1,200 feet from another community residence. This distance is measured from lot line to lot line and not the structure or the center of the property. And uh, the same requirement applies to recovery communities, uh, which is uh, the next part of that article, uh, which are basically the multifamily version of group homes. Um, the distancing requirement is uh, based upon the use. The question before you today is, does the distancing requirement between community residences end at the border of a neighboring jurisdiction, or does the 1,200 foot separation apply regardless of jurisdictional lines? Uh, on the next slide, thank you. So on the next slide um, has a staff's interpretation as well as the applicants. Um, staff interprets 1207.3.1 to be strictly a distance measurement and that jurisdictional lines are irrelevant because the zoning ordinance does not make reference to such lines. And the purpose of the distancing standard is to prevent clustering of community residences, recovery communities, and group care facilities so that an institutional environment is not created in neighborhoods. Uh, on the other side, staff understands that the applicant's interpretation is that the county cannot enforce zoning laws in other jurisdictions 
more than other jurisdictions can enforce zoning laws in Maricopa County. And that the ordinance does not specify that community residences in other jurisdictions cannot be within the 1200 foot separation district distance. Uh, the applicant also states that there's examples of the city of Peoria approving community residences within 1200 feet of Maricopa County. Uh, there in the staff report is a summary of how staff measures distancing. Uh, the staff would like to note the county does not enforce zoning ordinance regulations on property located in a different jurisdiction. And uh, the ter determination that basically occurs is whether a property in Maricopa County is within 1,200 feet of another community residence or recovery community regardless of jurisdiction. As the county abuts other jurisdictions in many places within the urbanized area, it would defeat the purpose of having the distancing standard if the measurement were terminated at a jurisdictional border. An example uh, would be county islands uh, near Sun City, Sun City West, uh, which are uh, areas that are uh, heavily, um, there's heavy interest um, from community residence operators for elder care and behavioral health care. Uh, and a decision in favor of the applicant's interpretation would, would have an effect on the area and the entire county. Uh, the distancing regulation prevents institution, institutionalization of neighborhoods. While a single community residence may have a valid argument for being sufficiently separated from another residence, a decision in favor uh, of the applicant's interpretation would certainly increase clustering in many other situations. And uh, there is an instrument that is a remedy to that, which is a special use permit by which an applicant may vary that distancing requirement with justification. Further, the distancing requirement um, prevents recovery communities, which are multifamily uh, group homes uh, permitted in multifamily zoning for individuals uh, within recovery from substance abuse from being within 1200 feet of each other. That also, the decision today would also have an effect on that as well. So based upon the language of the ordinance and the reasons for the distancing requirement, staff is asking the board to deny the appeal and to uphold the interpretation of article 1207.3.1. Thank you, good presentation. Wayne, you wanted to add something? Yes, just for the record, the specific applicant has raised this challenge because there is a group home in Peoria. Mr. Chairman, as you know, you are an employee of the city of Peoria. It's my view that this is not a specific application. This is an interpretation which has countywide implications. So I don't believe your employment in Peoria in any way impacts that, but I want to put it out there to give you the opportunity to make that decision. Uh, but as I say, this is not property to property specific. This is countywide, as you know, you've done other interpretations, but I think that should be on the record. And I'm and I'm fine with that. Yeah, it's nothing I'm trying to hide for sure. We have variance requests in Peoria and other jurisdictions through, you know, all the time interpretations as well. But yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I wouldn't want anybody to think that Peoria is slipping me money um, under the table to uphold things that they may want. I do have a question of, of either of you or anybody else. So typically, you know, we have separation requirements for marijuana and for adult uses and the other things. And those usually come to us as a variance request for a specific instance. Why wasn't this pursued as a variance for this specific instance rather than a countywide? And maybe it's a question for the applicant, but I'm just curious the difference. Yes. So um, like like we had today, we had a, a billboard mm -hmm. separation distance yeah. variance request. And, and there's been in the past marijuana separation distance request. When we wrote the uh, community residence text amendment a couple years back, um, we specifically designated the special use permit as the remedy of choice because of, of the <clears throat> there is a great deal of public interest in these and and we felt that that it needed to go to a 
through a legislative process with a full public participation because this is not the only standard involved with this, this distancing. It's also uh, the number of people um, is one in the ordinance as well. And, and when people are seeking special use permits, they, <clears throat> they would uh, potentially also seek a larger number of, of people living in, in the residence. And Mr. Chairman, to add to that, there's also a, a reason, a, a administrative reasonable accommodation process to the ordinance that other uses do not necessarily have. Understood. And there's a legal reason. And I should recall because I, you know, I worked at Roland Curley at the time and they were part of some of that discussion. Uh, um, but I wanted, I wanted that out there. So there's another legal reason and that is under the Fair Housing Act reasonable accommodations have to be reasonable and variances take a long time have a very high standard of proof whereas a special use permit is legislative and gives the board of supervisors more flexibility than you would have understood uh member person do you have a comment no i should say yes if you wanted to. oh definitely um any other questions of staff uh, by any of the board members at this time all right, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Is the applicant or applicant representative here? If you could please just provide your name for the record. Yeah, thank you, Chairman and Board. My name is Zachary Pebler with Zachary A. Pebler PLLC on behalf of the owner. Uh, my address is 3100 West Fort Ray Road, uh, number 101, Chandler, Arizona, 85226. Um, like Mr. Peck said, this is kind of a universal discussion. Um, I don't want to bore you with slides with a bunch of words on it. Um, I think this overall discussion of the zoning interpretation. Uh, today we're presenting uh, case BA 240022 uh, for the interpretation of the code article 1207.3.1. Uh, the property address, uh, well I guess that's irrelevant as well. Uh, today is about how the ordinance is interpreted uh, to protect both Maricopa County and owners and applicants and the glaring omission of detail that outside jurisdictional uh, consideration will be considered in fact, uh, when you take into consideration the definition of community, that that actually crosses jur jurisdictional lines and that applicants and owners should inherently just know that from beginning of application and submittal for their projects uh, moving forward. Section 105 in interpretation uh, states, nor is it intended by the ordinance to interfere with or abrogate, which is interference with the formal agreement, or annul any easements, covenants, or other agreements between the parties. The ordinance uh, for us, which is established to protect the parties, the ownership, stakeholders, and, and Maricopa County, have an expressed agreement through that ordinance, but the lack of the expressed language of third-party jurisdictional standing or influence within that ordinance by way of outside um, jurisdictional lines and in, in where Maricopa County's purview actually stops, uh, you know, violates that inter-party agreement between owner and uh, the county by lack of um, intent to consider those jurisdictional uh, involvements. Uh, chapter 12 of Article 1207.3.1 location, uh, there's issue as well, uh, introducing the third-party jurisdictions our, our justification should be upheld because it does abrogate the express agreement uh, between owner and Maricopa County. Uh, distancing of the property should be should not be subject to other jurisdictional law uh, or jurisdictional lines. And for our case specifically, um, there is no uh, other community residence within 1,200 feet of Maricopa County. But because we do cross jurisdictional lines in the city into the city of Peoria that my client has uh, been denied his uh, uh, application for a community residence. Um, staff's interpretation in their report, item one, said the purpose of distancing, uh, this, the purpose of the distancing standard is to prevent clustering of community residents. Um, this uh, picture right here was great, Ms. Applegate, I appreciate that. Uh, there's only two community residences or I'm sorry, there's only one community residence from the proposed uh, community residence and it's just slightly outside of that 1200 foot separation. Um, that future community residence, if approved, if the zoning interpretation would be approved, 
would even be separated by a planned mini storage facility directly to the south, public streets, and again, our point, a separate jurisdiction of the city of Peoria, which we hardly feel is qualified as clustering, but more of uh, just simply two community residences slightly within or, or slightly with uh, slightly within the 1200 foot se separation. With this, an exclusionary statement or disclosure of outside jurisdictional consideration should be implemented in the MCZO ordinance. Uh, we feel it's flawed in that reason. Uh, from intake to uh, the process now, my client was never told that uh, jur outside jurisdiction would be uh, considered up to this point. And we feel that that lack of contextual language um, sets up the owner for failure automatically. Uh, staff analysis number two mentions jurisdictional interpretation in the meaning word or phrase in the ordinance. It's not applied to a specific, specific site, but how staff interprets the ordinance for the entire county. Um, for that, we'd say let's revert back to section 105 by not implementing express language and inclusionary language of outside jurisdictions uh, within the ordinance, it becomes misleading and when my client's trying to promote the health and general welfare as cited in that section, um, it, it, it extinguishes that because all of a sudden he has to take into consideration uh, the city of Peoria in his case, or again, the third party uh, jurisdiction. The, the staff mentioned that this would become heavy targets and still heavy target for the same kind of community uses. Um, but still doesn't address the glaring withholding of language in the ordinance or staff communicating that third party involvement of jurisdictions are going to be accounted for when taking into consideration these separation requirements. Um, staff also mentioned if there's another community residence within 1200 feet, staff will deny a community residence application regardless of jurisdictional lines. Uh, that is no way expressed or dictated in the ordinance. Uh, a material stipulation to applicants, there should be one. Uh, omission of that language is, is my primary uh, argument today. Uh, not, not even just in the ordinance, it should be at the staff level when you guys uh, intake these kind of applications, uh, whether that's in a pre-app or a pre-conference um, application standard, uh, it, it should be mentioned. Uh, so our conclusion here is that there's just a, a glaring flaw for us in how the, the ordinance is written. It creates a, you know, a, a blindfold of, uh, for, for applicants to not know that not only are you dealing in, in some cases, the Maricopa County, but you're going to be dealing with an outside jurisdiction. Um, further, it obviously influences in having to coordinate with um, another jurisdiction as well. So the material language here sets up not knowing, uh, sets up the clients for, for failure uh, when there is no express language uh, to consider uh, these, these other jurisdictional lines uh, when, when making these um, uh, applications. As written, you know, we feel that this is pretty unfair. It creates an expectation that isn't expressed in that ordinance, and it just makes things further difficult when doing separation buffers that they have to consider uh, uh, other properties that are outside the legal purview of the, the, the county. Um, my clients now think that uh, disclosing third party jurisdictional lines is a good idea moving forward, uh, given the fact that we are where we are today. Uh, they ask that uh, the zoning interpretation now uh, would stop at jurisdictional lines and maybe work with uh, the Board of Supervisors to amend the ordinance to make this more clear moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of the applicant at this time by any of the board members? Right, seeing none, uh, Zach, if you just hold tight, we may have some questions coming back. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a public hearing, correct, for an interpretation. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? I don't have any re speaker request cards. Do we have anyone online? We do. Chairman, I, I have Daniel Eystrait online. Uh, Daniel needs to unmute his mic and then he can speak. Okay. 
Daniel, just provide in your own words uh, your name for the record and go ahead with your comments. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Daniel Listrate. Uh, I'm the actually architect on the project. Uh, on on the project on it, uh, Mr. Pebble is representing the owner. I just wanted to give some background information for the board to consider. Uh, so I'm the architect with the texture three 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 four North Twentieth Street, Phoenix, Arizona eight five zero one six. Uh, I just wanted to point out a few things. I think a question was brought up early on. Why has this not gone through a different process? And I just wanted to point out that we did apply for a special use permit, uh, which was denied by staff. And I also want to point out that the requires distance separation is 1,200 feet, and the other house separating is at 1,120. So we're talking about 80. Uh, the two properties overlap by 80 feet which we felt that was uh, small enough that a special use permit could be granted. Uh, as mentioned, that was denied by staff. We would have preferred to have this uh, be approved with a special use permit, but since it was not, this was our only other recourse. Uh, two other things that I wanted to point out, uh, also something that Mr. Pablo said was that when the owner purchased the property, uh, contacted Maricopa County to find out if this specific property was eligible to be used as an assistant living facility. And the answer that he was given was yes, because at the time, uh, staff uh, planning and zoning checked the, all the available, uh, uh, all the homes within a 1200 feet and there were none in Maricopa County. So when he was told that there is uh, that house qualifies, uh, the owner purchased the property, uh, hired us to do the plans. When we submitted the plans and done the full architectural and engineering drawings, we have also submitted the application for the land use, which was taken in. It was only later that we were informed that we need to provide a letter. Uh, Adam requested this letter a few times. We need to provide a letter from City of Peoria that there is no other homes within City of Peoria. We pro, uh, we've uh, contacted Mr. Cody Gleason, he's the planner at City of Peoria. I've worked with Cody quite a bit. We contacted Cody requesting a letter. Uh, we, ha uh, we have received emails from Cody, which we've then forwarded to Maricopa County uh, uh, Planning and Zoning, in which they state that they do not provide any letter to, for any properties that are not within their jurisdictions. So they said we will not provide a such letter and we have the emails to prove that. Uh, then Mr. Adam, um, uh, I think went on my, uh, Studio Bureau's website and found out that this had the house is within the 1200 feet. So that's how, but that information was uh, now given to us when the property owner purchased the property, when he checked to see if it qualifies. It was not given to us when we submitted the initial application that uh, we will not be able to qualify because, for example, uh, if this were to be granted right now and somebody wants to build a house, an assistant living home literally next door, which would not meet the separation, they will not even intake the application to begin with. Our application was taken in and got to several rounds of comments. The building plans were being reviewed and actually have been approved. So we have approved building plans, architectural, mechanical, MEP, structural, civil. They've all been approved. The only outstanding item being the land use, uh, the use permit. So this was what brought us in. And then the last point that I do wanted to make is uh, that city of Peoria, and again, it could be verified with Mr. Uh, Cody Gleason, does not require from any other jurisdiction to provide uh, zoning separation. Uh, this is to the point that they're trying to prevent cluster. So if somebody within Maricopa County Island builds an assistant living facility, and that is right adjacent to where City of Peoria is, and then somebody else from City of Peoria uh, owns a lot, literally next door, right at the border, applies for a license, once one was already granted by Maricopa County, the one right next door will be approved by City of Peoria as they do not require. And I know that because I worked on several projects and I happen to know of one case, I was the architect on all three of them, right of 67 and Pinnacle Peak, and this is easily justifiable, uh, verifiable. 67 and Pinnacle Peak is where City of Peoria, Glendale and Phoenix all meet at that corner. And there's three homes 
uh, one in each jurisdiction, they're all within that 1,200 separ uh, feet separation because they do not consider uh, others' jurisdictions when looking at the separation. So, uh, as Mr. Pavel said, I'm just here as the architect on the project to provide some background information to some questions that were brought up as far as why did this not go through a different procedure, which we tried, and why wasn't this information provided at the beginning, which was not, it was after it was intaked in, and then lastly, that city of, uh, if the intent is not to, to create cluster, if somebody else in uh, Maricopa County were to get a, a land uh, use permit to do an assistant living home right uh, adjacent to a city of Peoria or any other jurisdiction for that matter, be it Glendale or Phoenix, they will, uh, the other jurisdiction will grant a uh, license for assistant living community, even if there is one uh, in Maricopa County, uh, literally next door lot, because no other jurisdiction requires to provide separation from an adjoining uh, uh, jurisdiction. So that was all I had to say. If anybody has any questions, I'll be uh, gladly to answer. Thank, thank you very much. Any questions of the speaker? And, and just to clarify, the the request in front of us is for an interpretation of the county ordinance. Um, what the other communities do or do not do, particularly to Peoria, um, while maybe, um, augmenting or supplementing the request or is anecdotal doesn't necessarily pertain to the specifics of this particular request. Um, are there any other speakers online that we're aware of? Chairman, we're not aware of any other speakers. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Mr. Chairman, could I address a few yes, points? Yes, go right ahead. This is a legal matter. Uh, first, I'd just like to point out that this was an interesting agenda in that the Board of Adjustment by statute has three separate authorities and you had an application for each of them today. The you had you have an interpretation, you had variances, and you had a code compliance. And a temporary use permit. I said by statute. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but I, yeah. I do want to address some of the legal points that were raised. Both speakers questioned why staff didn't let an applicant know this was the interpretation. Staff does not give legal advice. If someone wants to know what the ordinance means, there's a process for formally applying for it, which is what eventually happened here. Whether or not this interpretation in the opinion of the applicant violates some other purpose of the ordinance is also not for you to decide. That's for the... Um, that's for the Board of Supervisors to decide. You are charged with looking at the words and phrases of the ordinance as it's written, as was the director when he made his interpretation. You, you are basically being asked to add language to the ordinance that does not now exist. That's what you would be doing here by adding in the jurisdictional requirement. I'd like to point out that the ordinance does say that the 1,200 foot separation will not apply across freeways or across canals, but the Board of Supervisors did not choose to say, nor will it apply across jurisdictional boundaries. I believe that had to do with Mr. Ellsworth's interpretation. His argument of the failures in the MCZO may be well taken, but again, that's for the Board of Supervisors to decide. All you're doing is looking at the language. There is no jurisdictional mention for these kinds of uses, for marijuana separation, for billboard separation. They are strictly linear, and that's how it was interpreted by staff. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, Darren, go ahead. Uh, one other issue. Uh, the ordinance simply speaks to separation of this type of use, and there's other uses from certain critical uses. We do that for billboards. We do that for marijuana facilities. There's there's other there's this uh, there's other types of adult businesses. Um, the ordinance is purposefully uh, silent and doesn't address the jurisdictional boundary in this instance. It does 
address jurisdictional boundaries when it comes to setbacks. Setbacks are measured from street lines or lot lines. Separation distances cross all of those things. And the ordinance specifically speaks to uh, a zoning district boundary line will be considered an ad hoc property line for purposes of setbacks. And that jurisdictional boundaries are zoning district boundary lines. So the ordinance in not speaking to jurisdictional boundaries when it comes to min se minimum separation distances between certain critical uses is purposeful. Um, and this is, is uh, this has this interpretation could have a significant impact and it would change the way we've done business for at least the 27 years I've been here. Understood. Thank you. Um, any other board members have comments? I do, I do have a couple myself. So here, here's my comments on this. One, I'm always, I always look greater at something that has countywide impacts, you know, the site specific. So that's why I asked the question, couldn't this have been done under a variance? Because that deals with a property and we've had just, we had the billboard, we've had marijuana cases that are site specific. And um, at least for myself, I've been pretty consistent that those numbers, you know, those distance requirements are somewhat arbitrary. They are ones that may be consistent with other jurisdictions or may not be, but they are, they're not born out in science. They're born out in, in planning, if you will. Um, therefore, for me, they've never been an absolute. Um, prior to Prior to this coming forward, I would have thought, yeah, a jurisdictional boundary should apply. But then I found out that it doesn't apply pretty much anywhere in the county except in Maricopa County. And that may be because, as been mentioned, there are county islands and there's things. But yeah, that has been stated, Peoria doesn't apply that standard. They, it's, it's as if it's the earth was flat and that's the edge of the world. Um, Glendale doesn't, Phoenix doesn't. A um, couple of others I looked into don't apply that standard. So while I, while I support the rationale behind the separation of the uses, I do believe that the county should be consistent in how it's applied as other places are as well. I'll get you in a second, Darren. Um, actually, that's all I'm going to say for right now. Go ahead, Darren. Uh, again, uh, each jurisdiction will have their own regulations. Uh, we would not, uh, we don't have any say over a, a, a facility or any permitting or zoning in the other jurisdiction. The other jurisdiction does not hear. The one big difference is, besides being entitled under different uh, parts of statute, is that our jurisdiction gets annexed into other jurisdictions. We become a, we are a part of that community. It's so it's different than a Phoenix Scottsdale border, a county border with any jurisdiction. At some point, should become a part of that jurisdiction, uh, and that needs to be taken into consideration. That's one reason we see. That's that's one reason that we. Uh, uh, so aggressively review certain uses from separation within the other jurisdictions. And when a person can't get confirmation that there is not a certain use or there is, uh, if there's trying to find out if there's a use within a certain radius, we do that. Um, and uh, so, and that's what happened here. Uh, there are recourses uh, available to them. There's special use permits. Uh, we might not be supportive. If there was options for variance, that would need to be a peculiar condition facing the property, such as uh, they have to be closer than 1,200 feet because there is a wash on their property that pushes them on the other side of the wash, something like that. Um, but, uh, but again, staff considers this a, a very important interpretation. We've consistently done business like this for the last quarter century at least. and. Um, just want you to take that in consideration. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, also, since it's my job to make sure how the record reads, 
I have to remind you that it is not your job in interpreting the ordinance to interpret it the way you wish it should be. You have to interpret it the way the Board of Supervisors wrote it. Under, understood, I, you know, um, this is not really the, a venue or a, it's really not a method to look at the legislative intent, if you will, for why something came forward. Uh, in my dealings at that time on this, I, I don't recall any discussion about jurisdictional boundaries, but I, I, I do like the aspect of the consistency with how others look at it. And I understand 100% what you're saying, Darren, about um, lands that get annexed. And at the same time, I look at the annexing jurisdiction um, would, would have to be accepting of whatever those circumstances are in an area that's about to be annexed. Um, I, I just, in this particular instance, because the provision was written that doesn't allow the variance for this particular situation. It required, I apologize. My, I have my kids and my wife on bypass. And of course, now is when they decide to text me for things. I, I apologize terribly. Um, but uh, what was I saying? Because this provision, because there's the avenue for the special use permit, so it kind of took that away from us. I feel that this particular type of, of, um, or this particular use and how the separation applies is different, and is treat it's treated differently on purpose, but it is different than how billboard separation and marijuana separation, other separations are done. So I, I personally, again, one of five, am in favor of, of that language in this instance as it applies to these uses uh, for kiss consistency. And that that's my two cents worth. I'll open it up to the board for other comments. Member Cardin. Hi, uh, Greg, thank you, uh, you or Chairman. Uh, you know that uh, you and I agree an extremely high percentage of the time I've got to say on this one, I'm I'm more persuaded by the uh, what what uh, Darren just uh, talked about uh, relating to how Maricopa encompasses all these different uh, municipalities and and there's a difference in that we get incorporated to them. It really doesn't go the other way, and and so there is a rationale that actually is uh, is appealing and even. Uh, one that's persuading me to to do as staff is asking us to do or recommending, I don't know the right way to say that, but to deny the appeal. Understood, member Persone. Thank you, member Cardin. Go ahead. Um, adding on to what member Cardin said, um, I'm inclined to agree with that. I also feel like um, these people that want to put forth um, community residences that are within the 1200 feet could then come in for a variance, right? Or special use permit after after the fact. So I feel like having this clarity countywide is helpful. And then we can treat it on a case by case basis when people come forward instead of having something uniform that um, may not be the, the right choice. Member Clapp. I would agree with that comment and board member Cardin. Um, I think the uh, the language is very clear and I like it. I don't see any reason to change it. Uh, and I would be uncomfortable about trying to change the language that was put forth by the Board of Supervisors. It makes sense to me that a jurisdictional line should not apply in these cases. So I am inclined to deny the uh, appeal. Thank you. Any other, Member Ward? I also would like to put my two cents in on that, Mr. Chairperson. Um, I am, I think that the community homes, um, there's a large differentiation of, of um, the effects of some types being closer together than others. And I am in a community where they, there are some of the ones that require a little more more um, on-site 
on-site um, professionals, I would be very, very leery of doing away with with any recommendations that that support um, a definition of a clarity of how far away they are. And because the other communities don't have this, maybe they need to look to Maricopa rather than us looking to the way they're doing it. So my two cents as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will call for, is there someone who wants to make a motion on this? If not, I, I, I will. But Member Ward. A motion that we keep the verbiage um, in item number, oh dear, I lost the item number here. As is. Ms. Mr. Chairman, I believe what the member is yes, asking thank for you. is to deny the appeal and uphold staff's uh, interpretation. So, yes. Member Ward, your motion would be to deny the appeal under BA 240022. We have a motion yes. for denial of the interpretation. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Second by Member Clapp. Um, Rosalie, if you'd please. Member Cardin? Yes. Member Ward? Yeah, Member Ward? Member Ward, we didn't hear you, but it looked like you mouthed yes. Do you want to give a thumbs up? Okay, okay. that's a yes. We got a yes. Member oh. Clapp? Yes. Vice Chair Person? Yes. Chairman Loper? No. Chairman, we have a motion of a denial by a vote of four to one. Thank you. Uh, best luck with your uh, other remedies for the situation. Move on to the next item, which is TU 240009, temporary use permit. Uh, Andrew? Mr. Chairman, we're not sure if the applicant is still present. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is David online. Um, they were on earlier, then I saw they went offline and completely dropped off of the of the meeting. They never communicated, so I don't know what the situation was, but, but they're no longer online. Thank you. I, with that said, um, I would be in favor. What's the date of the date of their November 8th? Correct. Yeah, so I don't know whether we could what happens if we continue? <laughs> yeah, typically the bylaws talk about it for variances if they're not here at automatic continuous. Does that include temporary use permit? I don't know that we can can take action. It doesn't. It, it really, oh no, I hate to use this word. It really depends on how you interpret an application before you for TUP. Is it an application for a temporary use permit or is it an appeal in this case from staff's denial? If you view it as an appeal, then the fact that they're absent would let you proceed. But I'm not sure it matters because if you deny it, they missed November 8th. If you continue it, they missed November 8th. So, or you know, it happens. Um, and what didn't this originate as a code complaint or am I thinking of a different one? Yeah, so. The case originally did start as a code complaint. Um, they have come in for a special use permit right. to remedy the code complaint. And then this is an alternative event that is happening while that process is still going forward. I, um, there, so go ahead, member person. Um, it, I was interpreting this when I looked at it to be a request for one specific event, but based on what you just said, it makes it sound like maybe they host events there periodically, and that's what the complaint was from? They have been cited for hosting events in the past, yes, but this is for this specific event only today. Okay. Uh, because we, we were obligated, if they're not here for a variance of a specific request, and because they were online, um, could be some technical issue. I'm, you know, I, I, I defer to the applicant, given the, the shadow, given the benefit of the doubt that they should have some opportunity to 
ask for, you know, have their day in court, so to speak. However, uh, I, I'll turn it over to the other board members for thoughts if we should act on this or if we should, you know, if the action should be a continuance, which I guess, Andrew, you'd probably have to reach out to the applicant and say, it's after that date, do you still want to go forward with the TUP? My guess is they probably have other dates they'd want to pursue. Um, it, let me open a public hearing real quick before you go into your You don't have to have a public hearing on if the question is whether you're going to continue it or not. Well, I just wanted to see if there is there anyone here. Do we have anyone online for this item? Nobody else online. There's nobody in attendance. Um, Mr. Chairman, just for the record, for those present, if this event is held without an approved temporary use permit, it, it is a zoning violation. Okay. So with that said, and um, I will turn it over to board members. It is in district four. Darn it, it's not my day. Um, but I, for consideration, but I'm inclined to continue it even knowing all the facts in front of us, but, uh, but that's just me. So anybody want to go ahead, member Person. Um, yes, I will make a motion that we continue case TU 240009 to the November 2024 Board of Adjustment hearing, and yeah, hopefully you can reach out to them. <laughs> uh, we have a motion for a continuance for a month. Is there a second? Second by second. Member Clapp. You beat your fern. Um, Rosalie, if you'd please take roll call. Member Cardin? Yes. Member Ward? Yes. Member Clapp? Yes. Vice Chair Person? Yes. Chairman Loper? Yes. Chairman, we have a motion for a continuance by a vote of five to zero. Thank you very much. Before we adjourn, I want to call attention to the Maricopa County Sheriff's deputies. We have two of them who've had to stand this entire time. I knew I know you wanted this to be quick. We're over two hours, and I apologize for that part of it. We appreciate what you're doing. Um, I know you're not supposed to sit, but I wouldn't tell if you did. So, but we thank you for not what you just do here to uh, protect us if something if that need arises for what for what you do every day thank you very much Hope mr chairman before you adjourn yeah. if i could invoke a point of personal privilege yes since we have all five members here today and very often at our november meeting when it's close to thanksgiving that's not the case i just want to let the board know that next month will be my last meeting i am retiring Max Carpinelli, who has been at many of these meetings, will be taking over. I just want to say I've been doing this now a long time, longer than any of you, as a matter of fact. I know Member Carton will be glad to know I'm not going to keep chirping at him about what the test is, but it really has been a pleasure getting to know each and every one of you. Um, it appears that I will be coming back part time, which will not include coming to the meetings, but if staff feels there's something where my expertise could help, I would obviously make myself available. And I wish everybody on the board happy holidays and all the best. And the same to you, Wayne. I know that we don't always agree on everything, but it, but I, I do ever take it personal, and I know you don't either. And it's been a privilege and an honor to have you giving that expertise, because I know you worked private sector for a while as well before uh, – being a public service and um, it's very much appreciated your insight certainly given us something to consider um, we haven't always listened to you but you you've rightfully defended us in the cases that have taken that next step and for that's appreciated as well go ahead you'll have one that um i will continue to defend uh successfully i'm sure i'm sure i i have no doubt that you will and i just question if the reason you're here still is because somehow you let that, you know, that's going forward. He's just nervous. We're going to screw it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as you no, should Congratulations, be. Wayne. That's exciting. I'm, I'm happy for you and yeah. wish you Thank all the you best. Thank you very much. I'm the newest member here and I appreciate your advice. You should come back and like in the crowd and just wear a disguise and see how, how long it takes us to. You won't this. want me to participate in the <laughs> <Yeah>. public hearings. <laughs> Three minutes, that's all you'd get. <laughs> oh, I can speak very fast. Uh, <laughs> thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Have a great uh, Halloween holiday and uh, be safe out there. And we'll see you in November. Thank you, Wayne. And thank you all.
Thank you all. Bye.